I know so many people took offense with me this morning. Your offense will be dealt with. And those who took offense with our Christmas trees, uh, we will have more as we get to, to Christmas, okay? Um, on the stage and everywhere. I'm not, I'm not against that stuff. People get legalistic and they have no Christ. They have no Jesus in their lives. They get legalistic. They have rules, regulations, laws, and they think that somehow their spirituality or their, their acceptance by God is locked up in, in mere things. Paul said these words in the book of Colossians. He says, do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. What was he meaning by that? He said legalism. He says, I don't want to want you to taste or touch or handle or get close to it. Because the handwriting of requirement against you has been wiped away. Meaning every requirement that the law has put against you is wiped away. I'm not saying it is a license to sin. I'm saying there is no law because it has been fulfilled by Christ on your behalf. Are you guys with me? Because you were unable. So what do we do? We put our trust in Him and we put our belief in Him. So people want to get very religious. People want to get very, and uh, you know, people are like, I'm going to start. I mean, I just made one statement yesterday people said they're going to unfollow us and stop following our ministry and all this stuff we are very happy that you're doing that we don't want you uh, because you would get offended by everything you know um, and uh, so yes I do those things on purpose and I'm going to share this morning on offense I, there's a righteous way to offend and there's an unrighteous way to offend and the problem is many people take offense when it is a righteous way, even in the church. And there are ways that God will offend people. There are ways that even leaders will offend people. And it is there for your growing. It, is an, it, it must be there. Otherwise, you are some liberal uh, 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 generation that, you know, if there's just one offense, if there's just one thing not going my way, then, uh, you know, I pack up and I leave. No. Um, offense. Jesus offended the religious system continually. So when I do that, I don't offend a brother that is weak in their faith. Absolutely not. I'm offending those who are legalistic and I'm offending those who are religious. There's a big difference. Who has a pharisaical spirit. Are you guys with me? Um... So I want to welcome those that are online. You can share the broadcast. You can tag someone. Uh, do it for us right now. Click on the thumbs up button on YouTube. Let the broadcast go out. And uh, 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 we are getting closer and closer to when we're going to reveal the project to you. Everything is going well. And um, it is, I think you're going to be very shocked and amazed at what God is doing. You know, some people are, th some people are very worried. They're like, you know... Um, uh, you know, there's something wrong with Prophet Leon, you know. He's not as anointed as he used to be, you know. I think the, I think the church finances is dropping, you know. Um, well, if it is dropping, then give more, but n <laughs> no. Um, don't just judge us by your insecurity. And, uh, you know, because this is the talk. By the end of the year, usually this is the type of talk that goes around with people you know we don't see him that often no i was away in krugersdorp and cape town for conferences um he's really missing apart from that i'm here every sunday almost every sunday literally um you know we're very worried about the church no a devil has entered you and i'm going to prove it to you out of scripture there are stages to being offended offense is good you have to experience it but we know, must know how to deal with it. If we don't know how to deal with it, the stages can become complete. And when the stages is complete, the end is destruction. The end thereof is destruction. Listen to me. There's no surer way for people to be removed from their destiny and from a church, a local church. Your destiny is found in the local church. Don't think that you're going to have your great call or call. No, everything starts in the local church. It is God's blessing that sends people out through the local church. Show me one minister, just one, who is effective, 
that has not come through the local church. You will not find one. The same way you will not find a police officer or a military uh, officer or anybody in a official governmental service coming without the government. It's called illegal. It's called impersonating. Are you guys with me? So people are impersonating ministers because they haven't come through the local church. So that is what Jesus calls them illegitimate. The Bible calls them illegitimate. They are false believers. Are you guys with me? They cast out devils without permission. Rev, uh, Matthew chapter number 721. They profess their faith, but they are not really saved. They haven't entered the sheepfold through the door. They have entered in another way, a different way. Are you guys with me? That is why offense. So the enemy, what does he do? Listen to me. The devil is not as powerful as you think he is. Trust me, he's been defeated, dethroned, and destroyed upon the cross. But what he does is he throws a thought into your head. And it goes until it's Diablos, until it gets right into your head. And he strikes Diablo, Diablo. He blows, Dia means through, and blow means to throw. So he throws a thought into your head until it breaks through and it becomes an offense. And the moment it becomes an offense, it takes root and it builds a stronghold. The moment it builds a stronghold, it creates a lie. The moment it is a lie, you now believe the lie instead of the truth. So now you're entering to a stage, and I'm not by the stages yet, but what we call deception. So everybody else is wrong and you are right. Your reality is right, a false reality that has been created through one small little thing called offense. And it started by one thing. Guess what? Leon said, I'm buying a big Christmas tree. So, um, you know. Everything with me, or they, they, I know it's bad and some ministers tell me, and God bless their darling hearts, they, they have pastoral hearts. They, um, they, they have pastoral hearts, so they, they, um, they uh, 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 like, Leon, you mustn't be like this, you mustn't provoke like this, you're going to lose your church, and blah, blah, blah. And I understand them, I understand their intention, but um, uh, 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 I understand their intention. But the, um, the uh, fact of the matter is, if you tell me I mustn't do something, I'm going to do it. <laughs> there are certain personality types that like that. That's like that. It's like, people are like, oh, crystals, dawn of crystals. Even your phone, there's a crystal. Am I saying you must worship crystals? Absolutely not. Then you are a devil and you have a devil. So my daughter comes and they do crystals or stone studies and all your kids do it at the school of grade one, grade two. And now oh, they like crystals, so they, she wants to buy a crystal. Must I say now it's from the devil? So when I say it's from the devil, she's like, but how, why does God create? But I thought it's God's creation. So we bought her a big crystal. No one is worshiping it, but some religious person is gonna see it because they have evil in their heart. And guess what? I still cast out devils out of them that think it is, it is evil. It's by, this things come down to faith. I told you, well, there's only one thing that is a sin. We will deliver you from deliverance next year. That who is not of faith is sin. So the one who doubts I can drink this water in doubt. Guess what? I'm sinning. Am I saying now you can do this? No, no, no. We're not giving you license. We'd rather don't do because there's stumbling blocks, there's weights, there's all these things. So do I as a minister, and I always need to make us, we always have to re reiterate it because people, people, um, people judge you through their perceptions. Do I drink? No, I don't drink. Do I smoke? No, I don't smoke. Do I worship crystals? crystals? No, I don't. Do I worship the Christmas tree? I don't. Do I? Do I don't do these things. But don't put a bondage and your weakness upon me. Okay? Do I celebrate Halloween? No, we don't celebrate Halloween. Okay? So, um, so people can assume a lot of things. Uh, 
Uh, they even made an article where they said that, you know, we had one leadership night here and we're laying hands and they said we are imparting the spirit of Sophia on people. Okay, first of all, the spirit of Sophia, let's get into it. The spirit of Sophia is the spirit of wisdom. I'm not speaking of the goddess of Sophia. Get over that nonsense. The spirit of Sophia, the Bible says, that Paul is saying uh, uh, that... Uh, I pray to the Lord Jesus Christ that He will give you the spirit of Sophia and, and Apocalypse, of wisdom and revelation, so that the eyes of your understanding, so they did this TV show about us and all these so-called theologians sitting there on a, on a stage, except the one who became our friend now, but um, the others. They said, and, and, and the one that became our friend didn't know they were doing a show against us, so it was cut and pasted. And, you know, they were talking about somebody else and it was pasted in by us. But the other theologians were sitting there and they, they were asked the question, is there something like a spirit of wisdom in the Bible? And there was three theologians, two normal ones and one lesbian one. And they're all sitting, that's what I heard, and they're all sitting there. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm just saying, allegedly, that's what I heard. Can't do anything to me because I didn't sign any documents. So I can talk about this show as much as I want to. They did everything to try to get me to sign the document. So, uh, and all of them sitting there, all these theologians, no, there's no such thing. Or they asked them the question, is there any place where the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom? And all those theologians sat there and said, no. Nowhere in the Bible is it that. I'm thinking, and you're teaching students at UNISA or wherever, you, whatever the colleges is, and you're saying the Holy Spirit is not the spirit of wisdom? Something is seriously wrong. So say with me, offense. So I want to touch on this subject because by this time of the year, and we don't want to be long, I want to be finished by 22, 10, around there. I'm going to do my best and then I'll be here tonight because we have to carry on with this message. So this morning I want to speak to you about the 10 stages of offense, but tonight is going to be a bit more important uh, where we're going to say um, how to deal with, what to do with, how to protect yourself from offense and how to deal with it, how to protect yourself in the future and how to deal with it and we're going to deal with it tonight. Uh, last week Sunday night was all, the presence of God was very strong in this place and uh, um, a lot of revelation came out so i will be here again tonight five o'clock but by this time of the year a lot of people take offense because they get tired when you are weak you take offense and there is thoughts i might have sounded silly when i said that you know um, when i used me as an example but that's what happens in the church is that people you see the spiritual matters people will take offense with anything they'll say you know a thought will just come to them so you know what? Prophet Leon hasn't greeted me for a whole two, for two years. He hasn't greeted me. Guess what happened? Diablos just breathed a thought into your head. Just breathed a thought into your head. Now, because the heart is not right, the soil of that heart receives that thought. It's called scandalon, offense. It is the bait of Satan. Are you guys with me? It is the bait of Satan. So my heart all of a sudden receives this bait, receives the seed. And as it receives the seed, if it is not dealt with there, it becomes a tree. If it is not dealt with there, it becomes a forest. Once it is a forest, trust me, you are gone. The devil has you. Now you are taken captive by Satan to do the will of Satan in the church. Give me the verse. Google the verse for me quickly. Uh, to say the will of Satan in the church, taken captive by the will of Satan. Give, give me that verse quickly so that people can understand what I'm saying. How serious offense is. And maybe those who are need this message is not here this morning. Maybe you're sitting right here. I'm not exactly sure. Second row, maybe on the third row, maybe on the first row. But uh, here, the, the message. message. Let's see if they can find it. Can you guys find it? Uh, let me find it. Okay. Go with me to. Um, uh, I'll get it now. Do you guys find it? Is it on the screen? 2 Timothy 2. Yeah, 2 Timothy 2, verse 26. So, 
and that they may come to their senses. Go there to one verse back. Let's see what it says. 2 Timothy. Let me see something here. Let's go to verse 24. Oh wait, let's, let's all go back to, this is actually very good. For now, let's go to verse 23. For now. Listen to this. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Say with me, avoid foolish talking. For they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Listen to me. Isn't it amazing that the Bible says that if God may perhaps grant them repentance it doesn't mean repentance to get back into the faith it means repentance of changing their minds in humility Greek may know the truth next verse and that they may know that they may come to their senses and escape the snare so the snare it is the trap of the devil the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. Are you guys with me? And Timothy was speaking, uh, Paul was speaking to Timothy about those in the church. He said, listen, Timothy, there are those that have opened up their ears and they've listened to things and they've taken the trap. They've taken the snare. They've taken the bait of Satan. And if they go on like this, they're going to be taken captive by the devil. Once they are taken captive by him, they no longer do the will of God but they do the will of Satan in the church. And when you don't have spiritual leadership, nobody discerns what is happening. And before they know it, a year later, the whole church is destroyed. Are you guys with them? It's silent in this place right now. I know that it's not a Shandai Shandai hallelujah message, but I want to help you with offense. And listen, no one is... No one is, what do they call it, immune to this, uh, 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 to this attack. I've been offended, and every single person sitting here will become offended. The, three, the thing is, how will you deal with that offense when it comes? Because an offense comes as a weapon of Satan to remove you from your destiny. It puts you in a snare. A snare, a pit, meaning it traps you that you cannot move further. So you become paralyzed, stagnated in your call. And what happens is 20 years later, God perhaps grants you repentance. So let me change the wording. God perhaps causes your eyes to open and realize I am wrong. I need to change my mind. But it's 20 years later. So I wasted 20 years of my life. And this is how he stops the kingdom of God. This is how he stops ministry. Look at what we're doing in, in seven years. In seven years, we have planted Krugersdorp, Centurion, Cape Town. We're busy with Durban, Belito site. Uh, we're busy with a huge project for our headquarters in seven years. And by eight and a half years, we might be done with this project already. Now, if I was offended, if I was offended, that 10 years would go like this without me knowing anything. And I would wake up and nothing would be done. Are you guys with me? That is why it is pivotal for people. Listen here, the people that move from church to church to church, what is it? It's offense. Many of you came here because you were offended by your previous church. Let's just admit it and uh, repent. It's very simple. Otherwise, it's going to become a cycle. You're going to be offended here as well. One person, one lady that left our church, she was with us, I think, for six years or so. 
And she sat in my office and she said she is offended and she knows she is leaving because of offense and she doesn't know how to deal with her heart. And the reason she was offended was because our leadership that was over her told her, please don't lay hands on that one in that manner. That's it. And the words came out, what, how, they, how should the leadership tell me what to do? I follow this other minister and they lay hands on the streets and do, well, go out in the streets and do it. But when it comes to our congregation, within our vicinity, where there's the parking lot, we don't have parking lot prophets, okay? Your leadership, you must understand authority. And guess what? You are offended, so you leave. So guess what? Your destiny is delayed. And usually those who are close get offended. Are you guys with me? Usually those, that's why I'm very careful by allowing people to come to my house. Very careful. Trust me. They come, they offend it. I don't have a big house. I'm thinking, Lord, what, what if we have a big house one day? Somebody walked into a rental house that we had. They just walked in and they got offended. And they made a statement to somebody. They said, how can he live in such a big house? It was a rental of 25,000 rand a month. Are you guys with me? I want you to see the mindset. And then what happens? Offense comes in. When offense comes in, it is the pathway. It begins to take you onto a destruction. It destroys your destiny. It destroys your calling. So let's go to Luke 17 verse 1. Luke 17 verse 1. And, you know, with this subject, I had to like really just pick and choose because it is a huge subject. I could preach on this thing for so long. But I thought I want to give you 10 stages. Luke 17 verse 1. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no one, uh, sorry, it is impossible that no offenses should come. You can put it in the New King James Version. But woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. So Jesus is speaking about offending somebody, becoming a stumbling block for a younger believer. Okay? Um, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, seven times in a day return to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So they said in relation to taking offense, they need more faith. The word offense, listen to this, it means scandalon. It means it is the part of the trap which the bait is on, which attracts the victim and is the snare. And in fact, in some translations it says it is the snare and the trap itself. So what it means this is that the bait or offense is the bait of Satan. It literally means the bait for a trap and the trap itself. It means to become displeased, resentful. It even means to feel hurt. When somebody is hurt, it means they're offended. I know people can say, I'm hurt, but it means the offenses come in. They don't want to admit it, but the moment hurt is present, offenses come in. When they feel hurt, are you guys with me? Now, I can feel hurt by something that is right, meaning that uh, I should feel hurt about it. And then I can feel hurt about something that I shouldn't feel hurt about it. The thing is, in the kingdom, there is no place for offense. Satan will bring things that will even make you feel justified and say, but it is my right to feel offended. Or it is my right to feel hurt. That one did this to me. That one did that to me. Abraham, too, listen, Abraham took his only son, pulled out a knife, put it over his body, about to stab it into him. And his son still had to love him after that. Are you guys with me? If you can overcome the test of offense, promotion comes your way. So the devil will bring offense, but God is using it. Remember, Satan for me, the way I understand Scripture and the way I preach, Satan is an employee of God. Please understand that. It means to resentment, annoyance, and it means to disagree. So with you to disagree. Any form of disagreement is a stage of offense already. 
Am I saying that somebody's not allowed to disagree with how I do things? No, there's two levels of disagreement. There's a disagreement where I just disagree, but it's not even entering into my heart. I'm mature. But then there's another round where I disagree and I begin to voice my disagreements or it stays and it lingers in my heart and I begin to act accordingly. Are you guys with me? So listen to this. Isn't it amazing that with military, people can go to a boot camp, they can get screamed at, they can get forced to do things. They can wake up two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, go through, go through uh, all these obstacle courses, screamed at here, humiliated in front of everyone, and they won't roll their eyes. In the church, we sing, we are soldiers for Jesus. And just one little thing come in your huff and puff and walk out of the church. How dare that encounter talk like that? How dare that, that prophet Leon speak like that? You know? How dare he speak about grace? Like, did, you do your, did you study any theology? But you think you know the Bible? Are you guys with me? So Christians, for me, are very immature in this regard. And the stage has to move past this point where offense is not taken. Listen, when we started the church, people were offended because this one stood by the door or that one greeted them. And I'll get these messages afterwards. Why? Because they're children in nappy still. When your children is in nappies, they complain about everything and you understand they are a child. So when somebody gets saved, I can understand they're a child. But not after they're in church for 20 years. Then something is, then there's a mental sickness there's some retardation. Uh, this person needs to go to an institute. I'm serious. Special needs. No importation. No uh, uh, training. You know. No volunteering. Nothing. Now people are going to get offended because I say special needs. Listen, listen, let, let's go to the verse. He says, Luke 17 verse 1, Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Listen to verse 3. Go through to verse 3. It says, Take heed to yourselves. So they take heed to yourselves. And Jesus is saying, listen here, offenses is going to come, but you need to protect your hearts. Are you guys with me? Guard your heart. Uh, protect your heart. The moment I don't protect my heart, a root of bitterness begins to spring up. The moment a root of bitterness springs up, go with me to, let me explain, go with you to Hebrews 12 verse 15. Hebrews 12 verse 15. Listen to this. The moment I don't protect my heart, it says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. I'm going to read it again. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Meaning, the grace of God cannot reach me anymore. Lest, why? It's, let me change the word in you to understand. Because of any root of bitterness springing up, causing trouble. And by this, Many become defiled. Come on, how many are not in church because they are defiled by offense? The devil took them. They cannot admit it because the devil blinded them. Because pride blinded them. And the Lord is not granting them repentance. I'm not speaking about forgiveness of sins. I'm speaking as repentance as in changing of mind. Are you guys with me? I'll do a proper teaching on repentance one day. We'll just get a lot of attacks on, uh, on, online. But repentance does not mean to for be forgiven of sin. It means to change your mind in order to believe unto Christ. So the Gentiles had a reprobate mind. Are you guys with me? They couldn't believe until the message of the gospel came. And the Bible says that God granted the Gentiles' repentance. 
He granted them, meaning God gave them the ability for their minds to change from a reprobate to a mind that can now believe. So everything, even your believing is a working of God that allows you to believe. It's called prevenient grace that comes to you and it gives you the ability. The problem is now many believers fall into offense and bitterness. And the moment they fall into bitterness or offense, which causes bitterness, they don't have the ability to repent. Not not to go to heaven, but to be back into fellowship with God. Are you guys with me? Is it okay? The older brother, the younger brother, the prodigal, and the older brother. The older brother was outside of the house when the younger, when the prodigal came back. And the Bible says the older brother was offended. And he was offended. What did it cause? It caused him to be out of the house. Offense takes you out of the house. If somebody is offended, I know they are on their way out. It is just a matter of time. Are you guys with me? In fact, if I can see that a person is not dealing with their offense and they're beginning to bring the will of Satan and I will preach, I will look you in the eye and I will preach and I will preach and I'll provoke you until you leave. Because I know that cancer will spread. And I'd rather protect the 99. Oh, but Jesus went off to the one. I'm not Jesus. I'm the <laughs> overseer of encounter. Do we do everything to save that one that is offended? Obviously, we do our best to do. The Bible says, do your best. Carry the burdens of your brother. But you can only do it to the degree that they understand. Are you guys with me? I can look at some people's eyes. Some are hard. They're like angry. I didn't come for this message. You're really offended by that. You can see offense on someone's face. It's very easy. First, they become stiff a little bit. <laughs> Once they are stiff, the eyes never lie. The countenance never lie. Then some people can be offended about menial things. Offense will blind you and lie and make a small mistake a big mistake. It will exaggerate everything. Are you guys with me? It's like, it's like Leon got a Christmas tree, but a fence will tell you that um, I go to rituals. I don't know how to explain. I don't greet you once. A fence will tell you I hate you. I actually want you out of the church. How dare he, 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 it never, he actually is conspiring against me. Now offense begins to get to what we call a political stage. And I'll show the stages just now. And now they begin to voice the disagreements to others. Defiling the minds of others. Now others who are weak are like, but you're right. You also didn't greet me for the last year. Are you guys with me? And the Bible calls it a war of words. Bloodshed. Because now believers are taken out of their destiny, out of their calling. They're taken out of the local church. So they cannot say they're not in the house, in a place where they can hear the word being preached for the saving of our souls, the Bible says. So guess what? My soul cannot be saved. Your spirit is saved. Don't worry about it. But now you're not under the preaching of the word, but you say, but I can go to another church. I can tell you now, those who are offended to leave this church can't find another church majority of them because unless that offense is dealt with they are trapped they in a pit unless that pastor knows how to get them out are you guys with me we had somebody i mean somebody that left about two years ago um they were offended and uh they uh they they were offended and they they uh said that um they said that uh I mean, I heard that up to now, two years later, can't find another church. Why? You left in a wrong way. That's why in the new members class, we ask people, how did you leave your previous church? With a blessing or not? Because if not, we have to deal with this thing appropriately. Because then we know there's offense, and we need to deal with that offense. Otherwise, you are um, going to fall into it again. Are you guys with me? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.17. I want to get to the stage just quickly, but let's go 1 Corinthians 3.17. So say with, me the, say with me the root of bitterness. 
defiles many. And it makes the grace of God to no longer be upon your life. What do I mean? I'm not speaking of saving grace. I'm speaking of the fellowship of God. So the grace that is upon your life that causes you to be blessed, which causes you to have fellowship with the Lord, which causes you to be in favor with God. You're blessed in business, blessed in, guess what? It is now being removed. All of a sudden, business is going down. All of a sudden, relationships is going down. All of a sudden, things aren't going good in the family anymore. What is happening? It is the grace that is being lifted or being removed. Are you guys with me? So listen to this, 1 Corinthians 3, 17. If anyone defiles, say with you, defiles. So it says the root of bitterness which defiles many. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So what does offense do? It brings in a defilement into the temple. I'm beginning to destroy the temple. And as I'm destroying the temple, mm, the Bible says that God will turn me over to destruction. This has got nothing to do with salvation and grace. It's to do with discipline. Are you guys with me? And we'll still speak about the levels and teach people on the levels of discipline and what the discipline of God is. But it is God turning a person over. Why? Offense is a free will factor. I choose to take offense. Or I choose not to take offense. Or if I have taken offense, I choose to forgive someone. Are you guys with me? And the longer you grow in this Christian journey, the greater the path is, or the, great, or the, or the more you answer the call of God. Let me rather say it like this. The more you answer the call of God, the more susceptible you become to offense. The closer you get to an anointing or an anointed person, the more susceptible you are for offense. Why don't I allow people to come to my house? Because when they come, they get offended. They see my children maybe being naughty or they see me not talking the Bible, uh, talking about a movie or something, they get offended. Why? They had self-righteousness. Are you guys with me? So for me to protect them from being destroyed, it's best to keep a distance until such a time where I feel this person is mature, their heart is for me. Like King David says, have you come to me, to his mighty men, to betray me on this? Or have you come to me to be with me, to be loyal to me and to serve me? He didn't say, have you come to serve God? He says, have you come to serve me? He didn't say, have you come to be loyal to God? He said, have you come to be loyal to me? Trust me, are you guys with me? So you have Christians that come to church to serve God. They're, it's fine. And then you have Christians that come to serve the vision and be a servant and understand, I cannot serve God unless I serve a man. I cannot honor God unless I honor a man. I cannot love God unless I love a man. So God requires my horizontal relationships to be fixed in order for my vertical relationship to be restored. If my horizontal relationships are not fixed, my vertical relationships cannot be restored. That's why Jesus says before, if you come to worship with your gift, leave your gift at the altar. If you know that your brother ought to have something against you, leave your gift and stop worshiping me. Go back and make right with your brother before you even try to pray or worship to me. Because unless these relationships are right, this relationship cannot be restored. So people have problem with all these horizontal relationships. And they wonder why can they not, hear, why does God not hear their prayers? Are you guys with me? I know it's not the most anointed, but it's the needed. Sometimes the good food is not good tasting food. Okay. Are you guys with me? And we preach this message every year, or we try to. And uh, some still get offended because even as I preach, they hear, but they do not hear. They listen, but they do not hear. They look, but they do not see. The words are not dropping in. 
do not become offended. If you become offended, be reminded of this message to say, what stage am I at? Let me begin to get out, seek help, humble myself. The Bible says, how does, so what does bitterness do and offense do? It causes the grace to be pushed away. So now if grace is pushed away, how do I get grace closer to me? The Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That God gives grace to those who humble themselves. So when I humble, guess what? The grace comes closer to my life now. Where bitterness pushes grace away, humility pulls grace closer. Are you guys with me? So now I humble myself and I begin to seek help, spiritual help. I let another righteous brother pray for me for my faults, my trespasses. And when I'm offended, I don't go to the person I'm offended by and say, listen, I just want to let you know I forgave you. No, you're self-righteous. That's not causing any restitution or restoration. Are you guys with me? Somebody who has really encountered God will go to a person and say, you know what? Forgive me because I've taken offense. And then I became bitter towards you. And you don't even bring up what they've done wrong. That's called maturity. That's why 1% makes it into their chosen calling of God. Many are called, but few are chosen. Are you guys with me? Are people with me? Let's get to the, let's get to the stages. I have so many other scriptures, but I'm not going to get to it. Let me get to Proverbs 17 verse 11. This is the stages. Proverbs 17 11. Well, this is the beginning of the stages. I want to finish in time. Proverbs 17 11. We also don't want to make these services too long for you guys so that, uh, so that uh, you can come back tonight. Tonight is important because we're going to finalize this message and we're going to minister to you. And it's pivotal that, put it in the NIV version, please. It's pivotal so that um, in December, when many people are away, when you are away and you are out of the house, it's easy to open yourself for a voice. Listen to this. Evildoers foster. Say with me, foster. Rebellion against God. The messenger of death will be sent against them. But it says rebellion is fostered. Meaning offense fosters in your heart. It's festering. It is a progress. It is a process. It doesn't just suddenly come and you're gone. It begins at a very small misunderstanding. Disagreement. That then begins to grow into a huge tree and a big green monster. That the, before you look again, the Bible says this. It says, go back to where we were. Oh, the, yes, there we were. It says, the messenger of death. So they're the messenger of death. It says, the, those who foster this type, this offense, this rebellion in their hearts. Death and a messenger of death, meaning destruction comes their way. And never think a messenger of death is of Satan. Are you guys with me? The angel of death in Egypt was sent by God. In fact, the angel of death was the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you guys with me? You sit like you know all this stuff. You look at me like, why are you preaching all this stuff? We know. It's okay. Um, the angel of death in the old covenant was the Lord Jesus Christ, the precious Lord and Savior, baby Jesus, that everyone says, when they commented yesterday on my Facebook, Jesus would never say that. No, he would say much worse. He would call you a pervert, a whitewashed tomb, rotten on the inside, putting a fake show up on the outside. That's what he would call you. So me putting up, I bought a big Christmas tree. Jesus would do much more than that. <laughs> Jesus would offend you so much. He would take a cup, which you were supposed to wash a couple of times under the law. And he would take a dirty cup and just drink out of it. And he would break the law. Are you guys with me? Now you come with your Christmas tree nonsense. Please. Jesus wouldn't say that. Your Jesus wouldn't say that. A fake Jesus. Jesus would call you a pervert. All those things. So 
So when I answer back, listen, people think I'm so offended. Do you know we get thousands of comments a day for entertainment's sake? When I don't have anything to do for a few minutes, I just go and reply. It's not because, oh, you know, Leon, Prophet Leon is so offended now. You know, he's so distracted from his calling. I'm not distracted. We have thousands of messages a day. Are you guys with me? So let's look at this. Go to the 10 stages. I want to finish this. In 10, 15 minutes, I want to be done with it. The 10 stages of offense. Number one, say with me, disagreement and familiarity. The first stage is the stage of disagreement and familiarity. The moment I become familiar, I find it easy to disagree. Hold on for me. Are you guys with me? Let me, let me, let me get, I want to get fast into it, but I want you to get this scriptures. Go through to John 12 verse 3. John 12 verse 3. Listen to this. John 12 verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. No, guys, New King James Version. Thank you. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spike nuts. Uh, you see, if I talk like that, what am I doing? Sometimes I'm hard because I need those who serve us to take offense so their heart can be tested. I mean, it shouldn't take offense, but it should come. And the more harder you can be on somebody, the more you know you can go to war with them. And you're not going to get some friendly fire. You know, people on a team with friendly fire, they should just be put out of the warfare. Because you're going to get into a tight situation, they're going to shoot your head off. Are you guys with me? Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil, of spikenard anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. Listen, the atmosphere gets filled with the anointing when you know how to honor. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor Jesus? Why did you not sell this and we could have fed the poor? The way you are running this financial budget is not in agreement with me. The problem here was not only the disagreement, it was the familiarity that Judas had to just speak like that to Jesus. And then we see further on how Jesus warned him at the supper. And he said, listen here, the one that is going to betray us is in the midst. And if you take the bread, the one who puts his hand in the bowl to take the bread will betray me. So do it and do it quickly. Judas became so familiar. He didn't hear Jesus' words. He put his hand right in the bowl. So familiarity will cause you to not hear and put the words of the one that you are close by at a certain level so you will miss secrets, miss things that can save your life. Is this dropping for you? So the first stage is the stage of disagreement and familiarity where I become so familiar, I begin to disagree. Now a lot of people will say, that uh, when Judas put his hand in the bowl, that Satan entered him there. But the scripture actually doesn't say that. It says that Satan did enter him there. But let's go. I want to read to you a verse before. Go through to John 13 verse 2. John 13 verse 2. I just want to get you this point through. This was before Judas put his hand in the bowl. So in around 20, verse 26, Jesus said, the one who puts his hand in the bowl will betray me. Do it and do it quickly. And then the Bible says this, Satan entered Judas. Are you guys with me? But here we go 20 verses before. Listen to this. It says, and supper being ended, the devil having already, having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So the Bible says way before Judas put his hand in the bowl, Satan has already put it in his heart to betray Jesus. Where did that betrayal come in? It's called the Judas kiss. It came in when he saw the oil being thrown on Jesus' feet. And he became familiar and he disagreed. And he disagreed with his leadership style. It was that moment that Satan entered him. 
offense entered his heart at the stage of familiarity and disagreement. If you don't like this message, welcome to the club of being offended. Because the laughter gets less, the smiles get less, the hallelujahs get less. Okay, stage number two. So, the stage number two is unmet expectations stage. The stage of unmet expectations. When I come with an expectation and that expectation is met, it is, a, is not met, it is a breeding ground for offense. So somebody comes to our church, they think, I'm going to be on that pulpit in three months. How about 15 years? We had people coming in, they said, they're going to run the youth here. They come in two weeks, they're two weeks by the church. They, God told me you're going to be a youth leader. I said, God told me you're going to sit in the chair, shut up. <laughs> and uh, go through the vision, deliverance, testing. Next week, they're gone. They go to another church, they're the youth leader there. There's some churches, anybody that goes from us to there, they become pastors and leaders because and, we disciple well. If you actually are with disciple, they guys are with me. So, uh, um, and the way, I, I'll get there now. So, certainly the unmet expectation stage. So, instead of reading all the scriptures, you can just take reference. I'm going to, just for the sake of time. But tonight, I'm going to go on. If I don't finish with the 10 stages this morning, it's really important we get the 10 stages. But uh, um, come tonight so that we can go into how not to be offended in the future and how to be set free. It is very important there are certain keys that you have to apply in your life mentally not to take offense. It is possible to be in a place of not taking offense. It is possible. Are you guys with me? So unmet expectations, Lazarus dies. This is in the book of John 11, uh, uh, chapter 11. John, Lazarus dies. And as Lazarus dies or is about to die and die, they call for Jesus. Jesus heard the news that Lazarus is sick unto death. I think it is. He heard the news and he waited four days later. And as he waited more, he got to the house and Mary, who was the one who put the anointing on his feet, who was always close to Jesus, the one that was spiritual, did not even come out to greet him. She stayed, the Bible says she stayed in the house being offended. Martha came out and greeted Jesus. And when Martha went to Mary and said, Mary, why are you not coming out to meet the master? He's here. The Bible says eventually Mary got up and she went to him. And the first words that came out of her mouth, she said, if you were here, Lazarus would have been alive. But Jesus, why, why did you not heed to our instruction? Come on, church people saying, why does pastor not listen to me and what I'm saying? Why are not they listening to my disagreements or my request? I asked you to come to my house to pray for somebody and you didn't even give a phone call. Or you send somebody else, you send the cell leader. And I, what happens? I become offended. So there's an unmet expectation. Are you guys with me? One of the keys not to be offended is don't have any expectations. When I meet somebody, I'm not having expectations with that person. I have very low expectations. Because if there's no expectations, if they disappoint me, it's fine. I never expected anything. Are you guys with me? So let's go to the third stage. I want to see if I can get through this. The hurting stage. The stage of hurt. The moment there's hurt, there's offense. And let me tell you, 80% of people here, or hurt. Somewhere in that hurt, there's offense. But you might say, but it's impossible not to be hurt. That voice in you right now that's manifesting. No, it is possible not to be hurt. Because when Jesus heals, when He saves, He does it properly. And if you know how to appropriate and respond, you can receive full healing. Are you guys with me? So where there's hurt, there's offense hidden. And I'm also going to go just for reference sake in 2 Samuel 13. You can read the chapter 2 Samuel 13. We see Absalom or his brother Amnon raping his sister Tamar. And Absalom being aware of it. 
And Absalom actually didn't address it and confront it straight on. The Bible says he said these words. He said to his sister Tamar, let's not speak about it. Don't talk to your brother about it. Just carry on as normal. That's what the Bible says. So he kept it in his heart. He didn't understand conflict management or healthy confrontation. And because he kept it in his heart, it fostered and it festered. And a few verses later, the Bible says that Absalom planned Amnon's murder. Meaning that when offense comes, you will murder your brothers and your sisters. Let's go to another verse. Genesis 37 verse 3. Put on the screen. Genesis 37 verse 3. It says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. They hated Joseph. And what did it end up? They tried to murder Joseph and throw him into a pit. So offense will cause hatred, which will cause you to want to spiritually murder. So what happens? You lash out and you attack your brothers. Uh, are you guys with me? This is still the third stage. Okay. There are 10 stages. The fourth stage is what we call the passivity. So the passivity. It's three, I put three words there. Passivity, spiritual stagnation, and isolation stage. Passivity, spiritual stagnation, and isolation stage. Passivity, spiritual stagnation, isolation stage. Jeremiah 48 verse 10. Go through to Jeremiah 48 verse 10. It said, Cursed are those who refuse to do the, works, the Lord's work. Those who are passive, cursed are them, who hold back their swords from shedding blood. He said, <laughs> you are hearing, but you are not hearing, church. Don't be religious. Don't let offense. Can you hear me out there? Yes. Cursed. Say with me, cursed. Is he who does the work, who do, uh, sorry, cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. Let, what translation am I reading? No, put in the NLT for me. NLT, listen to this. Curse are those who refuse to do the Lord's work, who holds back their swords from shedding blood. Meaning, curse are those who are saying, you know what, I just want to sit in the church. And listen to the preacher. I don't want to involve myself in the church. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. But you know, Jesus became a curse for us. Yes, we understand all of that. But I can bring a curse on myself. Every curse against me is broken. Absolutely. Christ became a curse for me on the cross. But there is still a consequence that follows. When I don't honor my parents. Are you guys with me? Which just means that long life will not be my portion. So I can inflict and self-inflict curses upon my life. So he's saying, listen, you won't have a blessed life when you're just a pew sitter and you don't involve yourself in the Lord's work and you don't pick up your sword and begin to shed blood, meaning fight battles and get into the war or enlist into the army of the Lord and begin to fight and begin to win souls or disciple or do something that can advance the kingdom of God. He said there's a blessing that you're not. In fact, there's a curse that will come upon your life. So get into the place of the blessing of the Lord. How do I get into there? I begin to fulfill the work of the Lord. I get involved. But when I am offended, I become passive. Are you guys with me? You can have your seats. I become passive. I become stagnated. And I go isolated. So the isolation. The Bible says a man who isolates himself. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all wise judgment. You know, a person that is offended, everyone is wrong. They are right. Everyone. You can bring 30 people in. All of them are wrong. And they have a defense and a justification for everything. But you did this. But get the but out of here. And let's break the deception because we haven't even gone into the deception stage. Listen to me. This is how offense works. 
Offense is the killer. Let's ignore the call of God. If you say, I'm not interested in the call of God. It's the killer of blessings. It's the killer of favor. It's the killer of a healthy family relationship. It's the killer of everything in a person's life. Are you guys with me? It's called offense. The fifth stage. So people who are passive becomes critical. The fifth stage says, I might stop at the fifth stage, we go on tonight. So there's 10 stages. I haven't even touched on the heavy ones, but let's touch on the fifth one and close with this one. So if you're the critical stage, now you begin to criticize. So now you begin to sit in a service and criticism comes out of your mouth. Or you sit at work and you're offended by your boss. This is not only spiritual. This is in your family, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, children to parents, employees to bosses. You know, he's a Christian boss. How does he treat me like that? Is he wrong? Yes, he's wrong. But the Bible says, take heed to yourself. Because offense and unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping somebody else will die. Yet you're dying. Are you guys with me? So the fifth stage is what we call the critical stage. This is where Miriam and Aaron came to Moses. And they began to say these words. Go with me to Numbers 12 verse 1 in the NLT. NLT, Numbers 12 verse 1. Listen to this. While they were at Hazareth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard them. You see, once a person becomes passive and isolated, they become uninvolved in a church. The moment they are uninvolved, criticism begins to come out and then they magnify faults. So do you know where we get complaints from? We don't get complaints from volunteers. We get complaints from those that are passive. Because offense from stage one will take you to a place where you don't want to be involved. You're just sitting in the chair in the back. I must speak of those in the back. Or you're at home, you come on every second, third, fourth Sunday. You've become passive. The devil has already isolated you. So guess what? Now you're only seeking your own desire. You want to be rich. I want to be my, have my white picket fence home. I want to survive me, myself, and I. Are you guys with me? Pride as I in the middle. Sin as I in the middle. Lucifer as I in the middle. Lucifer said five times, I will exalt my throne above the most high. I, me, myself, and I, life. The moment I'm that, I become an antichrist spirit. Are you guys with me? Antichrist is not against Christ. It is another Christ. So guess what? I become Christ. I become my own savior. I become my own purpose and my own desire. Christ is no longer my desire. His purpose is no longer my desire. So now I become critical. And now a minor fault becomes a major fault. And I begin to criticize. And I begin to become critical. And I have a, not a discerning heart, but a critical heart. So I criticize everything. Are you guys with me? But in Counter Church, you know, they seven years in this small little building, surely the Lord is not with them anymore. You know, there's Ichabod there. The glory has departed. I don't sense the anointing. And then they would talk like this. Do you remember how vibrant the church was a few years ago? Well, you know, do you remember when your children were seven years old, they were full of joy? But then when they were 13, they hated you. <laughs> they rebellious. I come into your home. They have attitudes. There's no common sense. Meaning people come into the church and they don't understand things. I don't know how to explain it. But the problem is they don't see what is going on behind the scenes, what God is doing. And then God allows them to be blinded by pride. And then they think they know everything. They don't see what God, they don't see we just put down 18 million on an asset and we're busy with a huge project that will be done soon. We've got other assets. In seven years, we've got other churches. Everything is paid cash. Are you guys with me? If that is not God, 
and we have done very well in our own strength that not even 1% of ministers in this country can do. Are you guys with me? When you see churches built, that's usually after 20, 30 years. Are you guys with me? I promise you now. So we made a decision. We said we're staying in this building because the moment we move, it's six million. And we can't afford to move to say, we can go bigger, but we couldn't find bigger places that could accommodate very well. We couldn't find. Um, uh, but we're going to stay until we go into a permanent place. And that was our vision. That was our goal. But people, you know, we had, we invited one minister once, uh, a musician, and they came in. I think they had Babalas, but let's leave that one. <laughs> leave that one alone completely. I am a prophet, I know. And uh, come in, order all these big things like to be on the stage. And we were small, 50 people, 80 people, played. They this great musician that played, and I'm thinking, dear Lord Jesus, there's no oil, nothing, no presence. Eventually, I'm like, our band, get behind and just get some oil in the place, you know, because there was nothing. But what did they see? They saw where we are. They didn't see where we were going. And many of these people that would only see where we are, when they saw, when, when they realized that where we were going, or they realized, oh, we got bigger, they come and they ask for jobs, forgetting what they did when they saw when we were small. Are you guys with me? Not being able to see vision or able to see further. And so God works and offense comes. And that is how things take you out of the race. And then people come back. Once we are going to be have everything and... The project is going to be done and all those things. Then they come back, but they've lost 10 years. They lost five years. They wasted the time. You only have one life to live. Don't waste it on offense. You, listen, it is like this. Every old person here. It is like this. You realize you are old. Are, are you guys with me? It's sick. You open your eyes, you're 60. You open your eyes, you're 70. And you still feel like you're 20. You still think like you're, meaning you, you still feel like, but I'm not supposed to be this old. I still feel like I'm young. That is where you get people that are 60 that are trying to wear tight uh, skinny jeans because <laughs> they still think. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just how it works. But it's like, it's like this. Then, uh, then, then offense takes you. And before you know it, your time is gone. And there's not another life. There's not an extended life. That's it. Are you guys with me? So offense is the destiny killer and destroyer. Stand to your feet wherever you are. Stand to your feet. We're going to uh, get into communion and giving right now. And uh, I want you to raise your hands for me quickly. Just wherever you are right now. Just raise your hands. Say with me. Say, Heavenly Father, deal with my heart in every aspect. I want it to be pleasing in your sight. I forgive anyone that has hurt me. Even as I take communion today, I forgive and I release them. Remove offense out of my heart, out of my spirit, and make me grow fast. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. You can have your seat. Let's give him a praise offering, church. Yeah. I'm going to see you 5 o'clock tonight. We're going to carry on. We're going to pray for you and say how to get over it. Amen. And as Prophet says, we're going to take communion together. And while they're getting the elements ready, if I can just read in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, uh, the scripture says, For this I received from the Lord, that which he also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Now, I want to just stop for a moment and explain something here. When we take communion together as a family, and as we do this on the first Sunday of every month, when we take communion together, there is a specific instruction that comes from Jesus that whenever we take communion together, we must do it in remembrance of Him. What does that mean? It means to actively call forth to mind the benefits of our salvation and all that took place at the cross and through His resurrection. It means that our remembrance is not just a fond memory. It is a reminder of the reality and the truth that we should be experiencing and living in. That we should be living in the dispensation of grace. It means that death has lost its sting. It means that hell has no hold and no grip over you. It means that any curse is broken and completely destroyed. That every legal requirement has been paid and purchased in full. And that the cross was a payment. And we have been given the Holy Spirit as a seal of that promise and of that payment. That is what we are to remember when we take communion together. So then it carries on in the next verse and says, In the same manner he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. It is a new covenant that we experience. And this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. How many of you know that blood is always used for redemption? In Scripture, blood is the currency of redemption. It is His blood that causes the new covenant to take place because we have been redeemed. And then He carries on and says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We are making a spiritual proclamation when we take communion together. We are proclaiming His death until He comes. We are proclaiming a dispensation. From his death until he comes again, it is the dispensation we're currently living in. And all the benefits we have of salvation. Next verse. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. We're going to take a moment to examine ourselves that we can take communion together in a worthy manner, rightly discerning the Lord's body And as Prophet has mentioned and shared this morning about offense, take communion this morning with no offense in your heart. Examine yourself and see where there's anything that is not aligning with the reality of what the Scripture says. And deal with that. Judge yourself that you will not be judged. That is what the Scripture says, and and it carries on to say that. But I want to ask, has everyone got the elements ready? Has everyone got received the elements? I want to ask that we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can take communion together this morning and that we can make a spiritual proclamation of your death until until you come again. Now, Father, I pray that as we take this communion together, it is symbolic, but we make a declaration this morning to the forces of darkness and all of hell that we have been purchased with a price, that we have been redeemed, that every curse has been canceled, every legal requirement has been canceled, and that we have received salvation. And Father, I pray that every single person that takes communion this morning will experience the full benefits of the price that was paid. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Church, let's take that which symbolizes His body that was crushed for our sins. Your spirit's like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp on to my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Let's also take the cup which symbolizes his blood that was shed for the new covenant in Jesus' name. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Amen. 
And if I can ask, if you can just pass the cups to your right, if you don't know which is right, it's that side. <laughs> you can just pass it down the aisles to the right, and we will be collecting the cups. And in the same manner as we just took communion, are you ready to honor the Lord with your substance? Amen. Amen. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of all your increase. But I want to share some scriptures this morning uh, concerning giving. And it's, it's very interesting that we did communion and giving together because communion is us reminding ourselves of the benefits of salvation, reminding ourselves of the promises of scripture that we can walk in. And now as we take the, the offering and we receive the offering, I want to share some scriptures and, and, and I want us to go to uh, John 8 verse 3. If we can just please go to John 8 verse 3. No, it's not this one. <laughs> just give me a second. Uh, Luke 8 verse 2 to 3. The John is for another one. The Bible says, And certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. Now hold on. I want to explain something from the scripture. These women had been ministered to by Jesus. Their lives had been transformed and changed by Jesus. And they decided and dedicated as a response to provide for Him from their substance. Just like the scripture says, honor the Lord with your substance. These women, just go back one verse. A certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits, there was healing. Infirmities were removed. Demons were cast out. Their lives had been changed because of Jesus the Christ. Just like our lives have been changed by Jesus the Christ. Just like how we have been redeemed. Just like how we have been saved. Just like how we have been set free from every curse. How we have been set free from every bondage. They had received an encounter with Jesus and they respond by supporting Him from their substance. Let's go to uh, John 12 verse 3. Prophet read this scripture just now, but I want to focus on the heart of Mary. Because the Bible says in Matthew 6 verse 21, Where your heart is, your treasure will be also. So let's look at where Mary's heart was. She was one of those who we mentioned just now in the scripture that supported him from his substance. The Bible says, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil. If you study it, when Judas responds and says, We could have sold this for 300 denarii. If you work that out, it's 300 days of wages. This is a year's salary. This is not her 10%. This is not her tithe. This is not anything. This is an offering because of who Jesus is to her. She put her treasure where her heart is. So she took this very costly oil of spike knot and anointed the feet of Jesus. Now, this oil would have been used to anoint the head of noblemen and kings. But she uses it for his feet. It would have been outrageous what she did. But these were the feet of the Messiah that healed her. These were the feet of the Messiah who cast the devils out of her, who changed her life. These feet were very special to her. So she wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. There is a fragrance that is generated from your heart of giving. There is a fragrance that comes up before God as a sweet smelling aroma that is pleasing towards Him when you offer sacrifices and when you give out of a heart of generosity because that models the type of giving that God does. So I want to I share this because we give out of our blessings. We are blessed and therefore we can give. We are blessed with spiritual blessings. We are blessed with our deliverance, our healing, our salvation. We are blessed with the fact that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
There are so many blessings that we've received. It's out of that that we respond with gratitude and honor, giving thanks to God. Amen. So church, if you're ready to give this morning, I want to ask if you can stand with us and raise a contact point. All of the details are on the screen. If you are online as well with us, if you can join in with us, stand even in your homes. Raise whatever contact point there is and our details are on the screen. We've got Cash App, we've got Venmo on our website. We also have PayPal and DonorBox and our, ele uh, our electronic details are there as well. For those in the building, we have the card machines at the back. There is sewing envelopes in the seat pocket in front of you. And all the details are on there. There's Zapper and SnapScan on the screens. And also you can use our website. So the giving details are available. But I want to ask you to raise a contact point. Father, we thank you for who you are in our lives. And Father, I thank you that we have this opportunity to honor you with our substance. That we can reveal where our heart is by our treasure. And Father, I pray for every single person. It might be the time for tithes for some, for every offering and every seed that will be brought into your storehouse this morning. Father, I pray that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing upon us that we would not have room enough to receive it. That this giving this morning would come up before you as a sweet smelling aroma, well pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, church. Be blessed as you give. You're welcome to come forward and give. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I'll lay at your feet I'll see through the night Oh God, the battle belongs Amen. And church, as you know, we take up a second offering and that goes towards the? Okay, I should have, should have prepped you. It goes towards the? Amen. The vision fund. And the vision fund goes towards the vision. And there's a very powerful scripture in 1 Samuel 2 verse 30. You don't have to go there. But the Bible says that God honors those who honor Him. And you honor God by honoring His works. And how many of you know that encounter is a work of God? There, there is no way that this is of man. It is a work of God. It is supernatural that we have been able to do what we have done so far. It is a work of God. The vision is a vision from God. So when you honor the work of God, God will honor you. Amen. And the vision fund goes towards the projects. Even as Prophet Leon mentioned, we're very close to announcing exactly the details of this massive project that we are currently busy with. This is what the Vision Fund goes towards. It goes towards expanding and establishing this ministry to enlarge the territories of this ministry. That is what the Vision Fund is. And I want you to see this as an investment. You are investing into the work of God. You are honoring the work of God that He is doing through Encounter Church. Amen. So if you're ready to give into the vision fund they're going to pass the baskets around on the screen you can see we have zapper and snap scan we also have the electronic details our giving details those at, at home you can also give online and we also have the card machines at the back which you can make use of so you can go ahead and give and be blessed as you give this morning Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the
The battle belongs to you. Every fear I'll lay at your feet. I'll see through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Mm. Amen, church. Don't miss tonight. At 4 p.m. we are praying, at 5 p.m. is our service, and as Prophet mentioned, he's going to be carrying on and going deeper into the subject and how to deal with it as well. Amen. So we'll see you tonight. God bless you. If you would like to give into this ministry, we have made giving your tithes, seed, or offering as simple and effortless as possible. You can simply log on to EncounterChurch.co.za or LeonDupria.com and click on the Give button. Here we show you the different ways to give. It's so easy. You will find giving options for local or international giving. PayFast is a fast and secure way for South Africans to give. You can give once off or make a recurring donation. Here you will find the Zapper and SnapScan QR codes as a simple and effortless way to scan and give into the ministry. If you prefer to make an electronic transfer, the banking details of our various campuses and the Visionary Fund are also readily available. For giving internationally, Cash App is one of our fast and simple giving platforms. PayPal is another method for quick and easy giving internationally. You can use your PayPal account or you can give straight from your credit card. DonorBox is also available, which accepts a variety of international giving methods. For those who would like to take hands with us and become a part of the incredible work that God is doing, become a friend and partner of Encounter and Leon Dupria. We have many partnership tiers available to suit your preference. Our friends and partners receive exclusive materials from Leon Dupria, as well as private live streams and exclusive events. Thank you for being part of what God is doing.